to challenge a little bit. I think one of the nice things about the Shaw Snyder meeting is they give you the opportunity to push the limits. And I'm going to try to push the limits a little bit with this talk. Whether I succeed or not, we'll find out. So I have no financial disclosure, and I will not be doing any off-label use. And what we're going to do today is we're going to try to decide um, how much should we tilt that table? Do we really need to do left uterine displacement? And that's going to be one of the challenges I'm going to post out to you. We're going to determine the amount of inhaled anesthetic for general anesthesia. We really are going to decide whether a rapid sequence is necessary for an elective cesarean delivery. And we're going to decide whether intubation should really make you sweat. So we're going to go through all those topics here. And you know what? Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be great if life was this simple? where you have the stork coming, bringing the baby to the mom, and you don't have to worry about anything. And there you find the mom and the baby doing skin to skin, because this is a baby-friendly uh, area. And you know, if you haven't heard it, one of the nicest songs that comes from this movie is where uh, Dumbo's mother sings to him, you know, rest your heart, rest your head close to my heart, never to bart, part baby of mine. And uh, you know, it's now that my kids are getting older, and uh, you know, they get a little angry at me because I gotta hug them every time I see them. And when they're just trying to pull away and become individuals themselves, um, it's been a, a, an interesting transition as my wife and I transition to that um, empty nest syndrome. So I'm gonna take you to labor and delivery. And this is just another day on labor and delivery. We have a 34-year-old woman who has a breech presentation who's scheduled for an elective cesarean section. She's the first case of the day, and she hasn't had anything to eat or drink, and she comes in. When the resident interviews, comes back and tells us that she had a previous vaginal delivery, and that, she, that delivery was complicated, but she had an accidental dural puncture. She remembers that it took them several times, and they stuck her numerous times to get the epidural in. And then after that was done, about a couple days later, she had to come back for an epidural blood patch, which didn't work. And then she had to get stuck again in the back and they had to do an epidural blood patch. And she really, really, really doesn't want general, um, a spinal anesthesia. She doesn't want to hear it. She really wants to go to sleep with this. This whole experience was pretty traumatic. So what would we do in uh, 2016? We'd sit there and we'd try to talk her into spinal anesthesia. You know, sit there, come on. No, it's different. I'm better. I, and then they look at you, no, you, you look like the same one. I, no, no, that wasn't me. I wasn't there then. You know, I've only been here one year. Oh, well, that doesn't reassure. Well, no, I've been here two years. You, know? um, you try to talk them into it. And, you know, at some point, you've got to sit there. You've got to honor the request. And so that's what we did. We honored her request for general anesthesia. We administered sodium citrate, 30 cc's PO, 10 milligrams of metoclopramide, 50 milligrams of renidine preoperatively. We then did a rapid sequence induction with propofol succinylcholine. I tilted the table 30, uh, 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 15 degrees, and we administered an inhaled anesthetic uh, and then nitrous uh, uh, after delivery. So the question comes up. So I'm going to dive a little bit. And you know, the one thing I can't do, I can't do a service to the airway as well as Rachel did yesterday. I mean, just Rachel's talk was superb. But I did want to highlight a couple of the points that she made out uh, for there. There really is a fear of the airway. And we're guilty of that, right? What if we spend all of yesterday talking about the airway, the airway, be worried about the airway? And where does this come from? Well, if we look at some old data, and it's old, but it's good. It was, comes from ROC, and what they were coming, the data is coming from South Africa. And in South Africa, they were doing general anesthetics routinely. And so we had a very large end. So we have 1,500 patients. And what you see here is what's the relative risk of a difficult intubation? When you look at a class two, higher, class three, even worse, and a class four, much higher. So we definitely know that if there's a class four, at least in 1992, there's the chance you're going to have a very difficult airway and possible failed intubation. So when we look at this, the question you're going to ask yourself, well, how often is a class four airway encountered in that regards? Well, the thing, look at this. This is one of my favorite studies. So what they did is they took 300, uh, 242 pregnant women. They had them at 12 weeks and 38 weeks. And they had them in the malampati position. So they're sitting upright, mouth open, tongue protruded, but not saying ah. And then they took pictures. And then they took the pictures and they mixed them up. So now you have 484 pictures. And they looked at them and they said, just rate the airway. And what's interesting is when you look at this, the number of class four airways, 
And as a reminder, the risk of a relative risk of a difficult intubation for class four versus a class one is 11.3. Now, when you look at the class four airways, it goes up by one third. So one third now had a class four airway. So if we look at these N, what we see here is the shaded area is 12 weeks. Shaded area is 12 weeks and the solid is 38 weeks. And look at that. What was a class four here? Or now one third more have a class uh, four airway. And there's that decrease in the class one. So we definitely know as the pregnancy progresses and they start gaining weight, the chance of encountering a class four airway increases. So that's just during pregnancy. How do we know about failed intubations? Well, this was uh, presented yesterday. So this is first 2008, 13 maternity hospital, 50,000 deliveries. But of these 50,000 deliveries, only 1,000 had uh, general anesthesia. You can see the grade three airway, uh, uh, 3.6, and then you can see the grade 4.6. And of this thousand patients, four had a failed intubation, so you can do the math. That means one in 250 had a failed intubation. So relatively high, you know, that's not good odds as we look at this. And then maybe we've gotten better. Remember, that's 2008. Now we're going to go to 2013. This is the most recent that I could find, taking a look at failed airway. It comes from the UK obstetric surveillance. And one of the nice things about the UK is they can keep track and uh, follow all these things and see the outcomes. And you can see they had 57 reports. Incidence of failed intubation is 1 in 224. Four patients aspirated, and you can see some of the risk factors for that. So despite the fact that we're now in this, this time period, about seven, eight years later, they're still having failed intubations with a change, without a change. It's 1 in 250. The problem is, and Lawrence, by the way, I just advanced your slide. So when you come back, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> his computer's up here, and I'm so used to that. I forgot there. So I'm <laughs> Uh, uh, on that, what is the role of video laryngoscopy in all this? And I think that's my argument with this whole thing that we've been talking about. Oh, the failed intubation, one in 250, one in 250. But now that's before video laryngoscopy was universally available. I remember being at the Shaw Snyder meeting. Ooh, I'm not going to say how long because I look young, right? Uh, but it was a while ago. And all my colleagues were up there talking about the video laryngoscope. And we didn't have one at Penn. And now we have several, and we have one just dedicated to obstetrics that's immediately available there. Is our fear justified with the video laryngology? I don't know, but I would argue probably not. Think about the chances. So what I want to ask real quickly, 10 years ago, how many people would say they would have done, a, in, in your main or in your practice, your practice, 10 years ago, how many people were doing awake, sedated, fiber optic intubations on difficult airways? How many are doing that in 2016? Oh, look at a lot of the hands went down. Why is that? Because we're using more video laryngoscopy and it's really challenging our concept of the difficult airway. So I just throw that out there as we think about that. So now the question is, should we tilt the table? And if we do, you know, one of our brides, if you want to watch me puke, put me on the tilt world. I will puke within the first turn. I do not. Uh, so I'm already experiencing, what is that? That's post-ride nausea vomiting? You know, uh, uh, it's not post hoc but I, I am seeing. How much would you tilt the table? So, you know, you're going to always tilt the table to the left. We tilted 15 degrees at our place. And I'm trying to see, is Nate here? Uh, there's Nate. So Nate, will you please verify? Nate's been with me for a while. With every case, every single case that we do, do I state to the patient, so if it was done today, I would tell the patient, oh, don't worry, Miss Smith, you're not going to fall. People only fall on Saturday, so you're OK. <laughs> every case. So the scrub tech really hates that. She hears that every time. You know, so if it's Monday, you say, oh, don't worry, you're not going to fall. People only fall on Monday, so you're OK. And patients really don't like it, right? They feel like they're going to fall. And what's the first thing they do? You watch the hands on the uh, armrest as they grasp it, <laughs> holding for dear life. You know, so why are we tilting the table? It goes back to this. What we're concerned about is aortic cable compression. <clears throat> so when the patient is lying supine, the uterus compresses the vena cava, which would decrease venous return, resulting in a lower cardiac output, <clears throat> as well as compressed aorta, 
which would decrease blood flow to the uterus and presents the problems. And that's been called the supine hypotensive syndrome. Not all pregnant women experience it because they have the sympathetic compensation, but that's what we're worried about, that when they lift supine, they experience this syndrome. Where does this go back? Well, this goes back to a, an article got published in 1943. And so I'd like to say this figure is from that original article, but I couldn't find the original article, but I um, was able to get a description of it. And what they did is they did both angiographic as well as measured venous pressures. And in angiographic studies, they showed that the vena cava uh, compressed the venous, uh, the venous return from the femoral veins. And when you measured the pressure in the femoral vein, it definitely was much higher suggesting there is a compression, there's this venous stasis. And I again, if you listen, Lawrence talked about yesterday with the concerns regarding uh, thromboembolism. But they also showed that the pressure in the femoral artery is lower, suggesting that not only is the vena cava compressed, but the aorta is compressed, resulting in a decrease in blood pressure. And that's what, uh, or at least we should say, a decrease in pressure below the compression. So you wouldn't detect it in the arm, but the concern is, is have we decreased um, uh, blood flow, have we decreased the pressure to the uterus? And what are some of the things that we've looked at? So now we're so worried. We've established that the supine hypotensive syndrome exists, so how do we compensate it? Well, we have to get that gravid uterus off the vena cava and off the uh, aorta. So here's taking a look at 20 pregnant women at term. And in 20 pregnant women at term, you can see here their stroke volume, um, cardiac output, and they used right lateral and left lateral, and see they're using uh, impedance plethysmography. The problem is, is that the right lateral and left lateral is 45 degrees. Now remember, my surgeons whine at 15 degrees. Imagine what you're going to say if you tilt the pet 45 degrees and try to sit there and try to get, they won't be able to do it. And you can see, this is why it was established on the left, tilting them to the left. Look at that, your cardiac output is the highest, stroke volume is the highest, and your heart rate goes down because you release that sympathetic and your uh, blood pressure uh, goes up. So that's this where, why we're tilting these patients to the side. So taking a look at the hemodynamic effects from this aortic cable compression, you can see that the, uh, uh, taking a look here, and where we see 0, 7.5, and 15, and 90 degrees. Gotta love that, how they tilted them 90, but they tilted them 90 degrees. And you can see, look at this. So they're establishing that the cardiac output at 15 degrees, but I'll argue, boy, there's really not much change, at least in this study, going for, yeah, it's higher. Yes, I guess tilting them 15 degrees has a benefit that is statistically significant, because remember, that's a statistically significant difference. I'll let you decide if that's clinically significant, right? We're not talking that big a change. And look at your stroke volume. Yes, statistically, you get a large enough N, you can take a small difference and make it statistically significant. Remember, your job is to decide whether it's clinically significant. And here you can see your uh, 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 systemic insulin resistance as well as your heart rate. So now, I, uh, Lawrence kind of stole a little bit of my thunder, but I really say he set me up for a perfect talk here because it's this study. And I'm not going to, I think Katie's probably going to focus on it too, but it's just such interesting. So if you hear it twice, it's okay. So it's 10 pregnant, 10 non-pregnant women. What they're doing is they're doing an MRI and they're doing them in the supine position. They're putting them in 15 degrees, 30 degrees, and 45 degrees left lateral. So they're tilting the table. What's the important point? So when women lie supine, right, we're worried about aortic compression. None of them had aortic compression. Okay, so let's be clear about that. None of them had aortic compression. All of them had vena compression. Okay, so we know that, right? So that's important. All of them had vena compression. How about when we tilt the table to 15 degrees? Well, guess what? There's no change in the vena compression. So when we're tilting the table 15 degrees, I argue we're treating ourselves. We're treating ourselves because there really is no change. The IVC compressed in pregnant women's supine in 15 degrees is the same. No different. Absolutely no difference. And only do you see a change in your vena cava when they're 30 degrees. I'll argue a t degree of tilt that you cannot do and keep the patient on the table. A degree of tilt you cannot do 
without the obstetrician complaining. And remember, the aorta wasn't compressed in supine. So why do we tilt these patients? Now in fairness, in fairness, I think this study needs to be remembered on that. Because what they did is they put these patients in this, these various positions. What this study showed, and I think it's so important for especially people who do their spinals on the side, that when you take a woman from sitting up and putting her supine and then or putting her supine to tilt, there is absolutely no benefit. But if you start already with a full lateral tilt and then put them in 15 degrees, there was a benefit in terms of the various things that are measured. So in fairness, when we look at that previous study, they just went to supine, lined them down, put them in that position. What this group said, hey, start in already a full lateral tilt. Start in a full lateral tilt, and then you will see a benefit. So I think, in fairness, when we do our spinals on the side, there is an advantage, in fact, of left lateral tilt to that 15 degrees, at least according to this study. So, and if we look at the fetal heart rate tracings, because remember, ultimately, isn't that what we're worried about? It's the effect on the baby. Here's 305 women who got epidural or intrathecal labor analgesia, not anesthesia, so let's be clear about that, and there was no difference in heart rate. Now, while I argue this, I'll also argue there is a special population you where you really have to do some form of tilt, and that's your morbidly obese. When we look at that original study, those were not obese patients that were doing the MRI. Here's 125 morbidly obese patients, and they all consistently have more systolic hypotension, and they have more late decelerations, and lower fetal pH. So I'll argue this is a subgroup of patients who benefit from tilt, and yet achieving that tilt is very hard. The other population is the patient with cardiac arrest. And the patient with cardiac arrest, uh, 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 we're talking about here. So what you should do, if a woman experiences a cardiac arrest, you should initiate CPR. And if the baby, in all resuscitative measures, so if you need to do shock, you do shock, you give meds. If mom is not resuscitated by minute four, at minute five, you should be doing a cesarean delivery, in, in fact. So remember, that's called the five minute rule. Four minutes of CPR, no effect, baby out by minute five. And this comes from this concept by getting the patient, uh, the uh, uh, baby out, would relieve any aortic cable compression that's there and uh, allow for greater resuscitative measures. <clears throat> so why do a perimortem cesarean section? Here's a 27-year-old woman. She would develop massive hemoptysis in the uh, 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 OR. Massive hemoptysis. They initiate CPR. They're doing this for 25 minutes. And they're like, geez, it's hopeless. Let's, let's, I mean, let's take the baby. The baby's still alive. We'll get the baby out, and at least we'll have one uh, positive outcome from this really unfortunate event. Baby comes out, immediate return of maternal circulation. Immediate return of maternal circulation. Suggesting that, hmm, maybe getting the baby out early is good for the mom. Is it good for the mom? Yeah, it relieves the of cable compression or it allows you, I don't want to say, I should say it probably allows you to do more effective CPR. Is it better for the baby? Yeah, take a look at this. Zero to five minutes, 42 infants having this all normal. Six to 10 minutes, eight infants, one had a neurologic deficit. 11 to 15 minutes, there were seven infants, six normal, one severe. So the longer you wait, the longer you keep the kid in, the worse the outcome for the baby. So that's where that five minute rule has come from. So is it valid? Well, that's where Katz was pretty cool. He postulated the rule, and then he goes on, he says, I published it in 1985. Let's look at all the case reports after I published it to see the impact. 38 cases of perimortem cesarean delivery, 34 infants survived. Of the 20 arrests with potentially resuscitatable, 13 mothers survived and were discharged in good order, and 12 of the 18 reported immediate return of circulation. So Bob, you're standing there so you're standing saying, Bob, why are we talking so much about this? Because anybody care to guess what the guidelines changed in 2015 state? Oh, that's proof that the five minute rules. So they now state chest compression should be performed at a rate 100 per minute, depth of two inches, and a compression rate. Let's all read together the next line. The patient should be placed supine because you cannot do effective chest compressions with 15 degree tilt. 
So the new guidelines published in 2015 state that the mother should be supine. They do advocate that there is this concept of left uterine uh, 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 compression, and they advocate for manual displacement because the ability to do compressions in the supine position, I mean, in the 15 degree, near impossible. So now the recommendation, mom supine, and somebody manually displaces, dis, uh, displaces uh, the uterus. <coughs> How about GI changes? We're always so worried about full stomachs and stuff. So what do we have here? This has led to the practice guidelines. So the guidelines just came out, wonderful. If you haven't read the document, you're gonna raise your right hand now and swear that in the next week, you're gonna go home and read the document. So, so important. And they advocate before surgical procedures, i.e. cesarean sections, uh, tubal ligations, practitioners should consider the timely administration of non-particulate antigens, H2 receptor antagonists, and or metoclopramide. I totally do that. I give all of that. What is that based on? The concern regarding a full stomach. Well, we definitely know labor causes a full stomach. Labor, right, definitely causes a full stomach. Well, what about pregnancy itself? So if the woman's not in labor, we have, what is going on here? Here's 32 pregnant women who are greater than 32 weeks. So those are pretty close to term pregnancies. They looked at their stomach contents, fasting, after ingesting clear fluids and food. And the whole purpose of the study was to see how good are we at ultrasound? Can we detect it? Guess how many patients who fasted in 32 weeks were full stomachs? Can you say zero, right? None of them. And only if they had the clear fluids or food were they full stomachs. So it's what we had been preaching all along. Labor delays gastric emptying. Pregnancy probably does not. And so the question is, do we need to do rapid sequences for elective cesarean deliveries who have not had, a, um, had labor? Remember, I'm not advocating. As I said, I'm just thinking a little bit out there. I'm throwing it out there. Uh, but we got to think about this. Anybody care to guess who this is? Anybody know who that is? That's general anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> So what are we worried about? Remember, Rachel split the front work again yesterday when she talked about recall during anesthesia. 1,000 patients getting general anesthetics, and you can see 25 patients. But this is the most important. So while I, boy, I feel guilty because I'm telling you stuff, this is a must read. I mean, really is a great, great paper. Um, and it's really an audit where they looked at the incidence of awareness. And the important thing behind this is look at the blue line represents the number of cases of awareness in that, okay? And the solid line represents the percentage of cases contributing to the denominator. So here is your cesarean delivery. Here's your cesarean delivery. Look at the incidence of awareness and look at the percentage of general anesthetics exceptionally high. So I would say, again, yeah, Houston, we have a problem here. And that's that concern regarding awareness. Here's the one that if you want to do, I haven't been brave enough to do it, and it's the isolated forearm technique. It's basically you put a tourniquet on their arm after you give your propofol suck, before you give the propofol sucks. And so then the arm hasn't been exposed, and you whisper in your ear as your colleague's intubating, squeeze my hand if it hurts. Oh, yeah, one-third will squeeze. At intubation, one-third squeeze. And then at skin incision, ask them to squeeze, and it, it drops to 27%. So at the end, none of them had recall. They couldn't recall it. But not only did they hear you say it, remember, you just you said, squeeze my hand if it hurts. So they processed, they did something, and they responded to it. Uh, and I think we've been a little bit guilty of the awareness for how long we've been preaching that MAC is decreased in pregnancy. The problem is, is that MAC is a spinal reflex. It is not a reflection of what the brain is seeing. And that's why I thought this study was so important. What they showed is that while MAC may be decreased in pregnancy, no question about it, the amount of anesthetic necessary to render EEG changes is no different from the pregnant than the non-pregnant. So one of the most important points we gotta do is we gotta change that. Look at the most recent <coughs> chestnut. If you look at the previous chestnut, it talked about the decreased amount of anesthetic that's necessary for general anesthesia. Ain't there anymore. It's very clear in there that the amount of anesthetic is the exact same. Anesthetic requirements, whether you're pregnant or not, are the same. And 
That's one of the reasons why I think we've had such a concern about awareness, that we'd gone around preaching that MAC is decreased, that, well, yes, MAC may be decreased, the amount of setting required is not different. So let's take a look at some of the changes. What will we do for an elective cesarean delivery in 2016? I definitely give sodium citrate medical for my blocked. Remember, this is how we do it. These with the guidelines recommend I'm going to follow the guidelines. I'm going to try to talk the patient into a spinal anesthetic. And if she says no, I'm going to try to talk the patient into a spinal anesthetic again. <laughs> you know, you're going to sit there and say, you should really, really have spinal anesthesia. And then if she sits there, we're going to tilt the table 15 degrees. I'm going to do a rapid sequence induction and we give a reduced amount of anesthetic. Not anymore. I shouldn't say we would do that. But, you know, a lot of people still do. What would I do in 2020? I don't know. I'm going to think about it, but I probably wouldn't give any pre-meds. They're not full stomachs. So what are we trying to prevent in that one? Again, I'm, I'm not saying the things. Please follow the obstetric anesthesia guidelines on that. But I'm just putting it out there that we've got to start thinking about this. And we're going to allow her to choose what she wants. She might want general anesthesia, and that's OK for her. I'm going to keep her supine. Unless she falls in that group and morbidly obese, I'm actually going to tilt. But I'm going to put her supine. I'm probably going to do induction agent, mass ventilate, and put an LMA in. Right? Not a full stomach. And I think the same amount, possibly even more of inhaled anesthetic as any other case. So what I've done is laid the groundwork. So this will be hopefully a lecture that will be for so I mean Shaw Snyder 2020. And you'll either say, Bob, you are right, or Bob, you have no idea what you're talking about. But I want you to be aware of the literature. It is evolving as we think about the practice that we do.